evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Ruth Pierce, the mayor of the city of Twin Falls. I'd like to welcome all of you to the town hall tonight. I, this is for the Quagga Muscle, as you are aware. I'm going to turn the time over to Chanel Tewal, who is our director of ag in the state of Idaho. Do a mic check real quick. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. So we're going to do quick introductions. I feel like the room got really quiet when we walked in. So we <laughs> we don't want you to feel like this. we're going over serious stuff, but we hope you ask questions. Um, this is truly meant to be an opportunity for folks to hear what we're doing, to make sure that you ask the questions either that your constituents have or that you have, and we go through um, and leave no stone unturned. This is not meant to uh, be anything but a, an open project, and we want to talk to everyone about the threat that we face and what we're trying to do about it. So as the mayor mentioned, I'm Chanel Tewell. I'm the director of the Department of Agriculture for Idaho. We'll go through and introduce our team really quickly, and then we'll launch right into our presentation. Lloyd Knight, Deputy Director, Idaho Department of Ag. Jeremy Varley, Section Manager, uh, Department of Ag. And uh, we have a number of other folks from the Department of Ag team. Uh, one person who isn't here because he has been absolutely uh, grinding on the operations side is Nick Zerflu, and he's our Bureau Chief in the Plants Division, oversees all things invasive. Uh, he's not here, but he's been out in the field practically day and night, and so it's somebody that you may have interacted with, as well as our PIO and our Plants Division Administrator, and also a lot of agency partners. So uh, we'll just get going right into the slide here, into the presentation. Got to figure out the technical side. I have a gavel. Just a moment. Hey. Maybe. Might need some help, Sydney, but we're just going to start talking. Okay. So, for a recap, and I think everyone has probably been absolutely bombarded by radio ads and news media, and a thank you to the, the media partners who have gotten the word out on things. But for anyone who doesn't know what we're doing and what we're facing, on September 18th, the Idaho State Department of Agriculture detected uh, zelliger, that is the larval form of uh, quagga mussel, in the Snake River. Uh, what we have done since that time is a really aggressive approach to delimiting and sampling the Snake River. Lloyd's going to talk about that a little bit. We know a lot of you came today with questions about how far upriver, how far downriver, what's the impact area, and all those sorts of things. What I wanted to do for you is kind of cue up just the, the general scope of the project and what we are trying to do. If you have not heard this already, quagga mussels pose a huge threat to the state of Idaho. We have worked for 15 years, um, thanks to partnership with the legislature and uh, a huge amount of investment and direction from policymakers in Idaho to run a program to try to prevent the introduction of quagga and zebra mussels in the state of Idaho. Um, these, these are actually Jeremy's slides, so we'll just, that's okay. Um, you can see right here, this is actually perfect, um, what a muscle looks like. And I think a lot of people have seen this maybe little tiny thing on a screen and thought, what, what's the big deal? And we can go through that a little bit. We have a lot of data of how other states interact with quagga muscles, unfortunately, and they had them before they knew what was coming. So quagga muscles have affected the Great Lakes, the uh, Colorado River Basin and a number of other areas, those areas of the country that are affected by quagga mussels spend hundreds of millions of dollars every year on cleanup. Those are in systems, if you think about the Great Lakes, they have an annual appropriation from Congress because cleanup is so significant and so bad to try to get through the quagga mussel mess. And you can imagine in the Great Lakes, that is a place where you don't have as much hydropower gen power generation as we have in Idaho, and they're also not as heavily dependent on irrigation. So we have always understood that if these uh, species were allowed to be introduced in Idaho, if they were allowed to take off, it would irreparably harm the ways that we interact with Idaho water, meaning our irrigation, our hydropower, our recreation. If you're a fisherman in the audience and you, and you love to, to fish or you love the, just the natural ecosystem of the river, that's what would change as well. Mussels are incredibly persistent, they're prolific, they're very, very good about going into a water body and taking over and creating a monoculture. 
So we have understood, and, and this is important to understand when you listen to what we're going to talk about later on with treatment, we need everyone to understand that if allowed to take off in a river system or in a water body in Idaho, they are going to outcompete other species in the river. So that means fish, it means other things that we want to take care of there that we love. Um, it also means it would change how we get our hydropower, what the cost looks like there, and have a huge, huge impact on irrigation. And I'm going to ask our folks right now, Sydney, would you mind, or does, if anyone has seen the irrigation pipe, if we have one up here with the license plate, come take a look, or Andrea, if you're there. Come take a look at what, oh, perfect, here we go. Look at that, that's great. Um, this is what mussels do in the water. They like to find anything hard, it's what we would call a substrate, and they like to attach to it and absolutely take over a system. This is a license plate. We also have the same examples with irrigation pipes. And what you see is an absolute cluster that gets an irrigation pipe down to a trickle. We know that that is not something that we want. So what we're going to talk about today is something that is probably the most aggressive approach that's ever been tried in the United States. This is a day none of us ever wanted to see come. Um, we're going to talk about how we got here with sampling and what that means. But we have implemented a project that is at a very aggressive pace. Um, the color, uh, in Colorado, mussels were detected in a lake, an adult mussel actually, and through a number, for a number of reasons, a number of factors, it took the state of Colorado about six months to respond to finding an adult mussel in one of their lakes. We're going to respond in about two weeks. And that pace is probably a little bit difficult for stakeholders because it's so fast, but there is a reason for that. And we have a very, very finite window in the river to try to be successful. So what we know at this point in the river is that river flows are, are pretty low, but they're not so low that we have exposed points in the river that aren't going to get treated. And so we have this little window where flows are low, but irrigation hasn't been shut off. And that is a perfect time for us to try to treat. Because if we were to wait until irrigation is fully off, and we have been working with our, our canal company partners who have been absolutely invaluable in helping us learn what we need to on the river. Um, if we go it much later in the year, what we're going to have is, is river flows that drop even lower. And that can create pools where, you have, uh, where you're trying to get a treatment out, but you can't reach a pool or a structure that has been exposed to air. The other thing about it is every day that the frog mussels are in the river is another day for them to try to establish a population. So we are working in this very, very narrow window to try to take care of, of the population that we know is there. So we're going to turn, um, talk about sampling, talk about what we have found along the river. Then we're going to talk about treatment and uh, all of the groups that we've worked with on outreach because it has been extensive, even though it's been really, really fast. We have been lighting up everybody's phone lines from, from here to D.C., frankly, on what we're going to do about this problem. And then Sydney, uh, Sydney has cue card or, uh, note cards for us if anyone has questions, but we also know that if, if you have questions and you want to ask us something, this is an opportunity, and we really want to hear from everyone as well. So I'm going to turn it over to Lloyd Knight, our deputy director, who's going to talk about sampling and what we've found and what we haven't found. Good evening, everyone. I think I've got a couple of slides here to... So, we've been asked the question a couple of times, you know, how and why did we find it, and, and what led us to think there was an issue. And, and one of the things I wanted to point to is uh, this came about as, uh, as part of our normal routine monitoring that we've done for about 15 years. Each year we take about 1,500 samples. Um, we call them Bellager samples. Bellagers are the the larval juvenile form of the quagga mussel and zebra mussel. Um, we take about 1,500 of these samples uh, annually each year. And we do it statewide. We do um, water bodies, as you can see. Every dot on this map represents a villager sample. You probably recognize the basics of what you see there in the river systems of the state, maybe one of your local favorite lakes or reservoirs. We do those samples over the course of the summer. Uh, most of these water bodies will get anywhere from two to five samples a year. So we try to do multiple samples, sampling events in a year, uh, not just a one and done. And the, and the purpose of that sampling primarily is to try to identify any infestation that happens early enough that we can do something about it. So I answered a question at some point in the last couple of weeks if we expected something like this to happen. Certainly you never want to, but we have planned for it. And part of this sampling effort is not only the 1,500 samples that we take each year as we have for 15 years, 
but it's also looking at what we call substrate samples. The license plate is a nice prop, and, and that, I should note, did not come from Idaho water. That was actually in Lake Mead for a number of weeks down there to get the mussels on it. It's a nice prop, but that gives you an idea of the kind of thing we're looking for when we do substrate sampling. So we'll put a PVC pipe or we'll put something like that in the water. We have a lot of partners that help us in checking these substrate samples. Our staff will check. We will walk reservoirs and, 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 and canals and such in locations across the state after water goes out. But we do that with the idea of trying to find adults and villagers before they're too far gone to do anything. So what we found a few weeks ago is, is part of that routine monitoring. Um, this is part of a program. I know folks probably think the most obvious part of our program and most visible are the boat check stations, and they certainly are. That's also part of the prevention program, but so is the villager sampling. Specifically to the presence of villagers that we identified here in this stretch of the river, um, it started with finding a number of samples that had one to three to four villagers in each sample. Villagers are microscopic, so I'm not talking about samples that had a whole lot of stuff in them. But they, they, they came up as positive. We'd go through and get microscopy, get them looked at under a microscope by trained laboratories um, to do that. Um, when they get a positive, we send those for genetic confirmation. And before we identify a water body as positive, we like to see multiple samples, uh, multiple sampling events confirmed by microscopy and by DNA. And the reason we have such a stringent standard for that is we recognize that, that you know, we want to really be able to see in front of us something definitive to tell us there's a problem. There's enough different kinds of species that look like um, quagga and zebra mussel under a microscope that you want to verify genetically what you have, and that's important. It's important that it's on multiple samples or multiple sampling events. It could be possible that something is introduced into the system that isn't really a resident of the system that gets introduced and won't survive. And, and one of the things I think Chanel noted is um, that part of that standard is ensuring that, um, you know, we don't just see a ghost that something's not there behind it. So what you see represented there are the villagers. We, we, we were looking for, and I tell people it's a little bit like a game of battleship, what we look for is to try to then intensify our sampling through what we call a delimiting survey. So those initial samples are on a certain grid. We find a positive. Now we're going to go in with a tighter grid because we really want to look and see what we can find, and we're looking for a plume of those villagers. We found that plume represented by the orange and red dots that are in the center of the picture. So that pointed to us that there was 20, 30, 40 villagers in, in three samples. So that told us this may be a hot spot that we're looking at now. And so our folks went out and did intensive sampling in that area, in that affected area from Centennial Park to Twin Falls. We also did a delimiting survey that included everything upstream and downstream. We've gone in the last two weeks, we've done villager sampling as far um, south as, the, as uh, the Idaho Power Complex of dams around Bliss and Hagerman. We've gone as far as the city of Burley upstream. We've done Walcott, we've done, no, we have, well, yeah, we have done Walcott, we've done Wilson, Murtaugh, we've done all of those areas, from Milner up, we've done all of that. So far, everything's come back negative except for the dots that you see in the picture in front of you. And that's all just been in the last two or three weeks. So it's been a heavy concentration of sampling that our staff has done. We even had folks that walked upstream from the upper reaches above Twin Falls Dam, and they walked through to, through the canyon to, uh, Cauldron Lynn and all the way up through there as well on foot just to make sure there wasn't a pool there where there was something that we were missing. In the middle of all of this, once we identified the plume, uh, two of our staff, Jeremy and uh, another gal actually that is from the Magic Valley, um, dove in that area where the plume was and found an adult on a rock in 16 feet of water. Um, I think Jeremy called it a needle in a two-mile haystack. Uh, we're very fortunate they found that. I've had a couple people ask if that's a bad thing, and I actually tell them I think, in my opinion, it's a good thing that we found the adult. We know that we have a population there. It's not that we're just seeing villagers. Uh, go back to seeing ghosts in my terminology. Um, but we did find that adult. It verified, I think, for us what we had and, and gave us an area to concentrate on as Jeremy goes through the treatment. 
So again, a couple of the key points is this was found during routine monitoring. It wasn't something that necessarily surprised us from the standpoint of somebody finding something else and bringing it into us. It was part of the program that we did. The delimiting has gone very well from the standpoint of confirming where we have villagers and where we don't. We have sampled extensively throughout this middle part of the Snake River. Um, we've been in communication with a number of different partners, including uh, water users, uh, power company, uh, Idaho Power, canal companies, as we've talked about what we're finding, what we're planning to do, uh, things they can look for, um, and really relied on them to help build the picture so that Jeremy and his team, the rest of our team, could work on the treatment plan. So I think I'll just then hand it over to Jeremy and let him talk about the treatment plan. Thank you, Director Tewalt and Deputy Director Knight for uh, that introduction and for bringing us up to speed on what the current picture is with the, the quagga mussel in uh, the Snake River. So I'm just going to dive right into the, the, the meat of how we got to where we are today and looking at how do we control this new invasive species in the river. Um, this has been a culmination of a lot of decision making, a lot of time, a lot of effort um, by our staff, by countless hours in the field trying to go through things as well as also in the office going through a lot of literature review, trying to make sure that we make the best decision possible to have the most success possible because we know what the risks are. So when it comes to options for treatment of quagga mussel, um, there's really only kind of four options out there. Prevention, molluscicides, biological control, or do nothing. Um, doing nothing is not uh, the best option. Um, these current infestations that we have that have the potential to be a threat to the entirety of the Columbia River system. Um, so that's all points downstream, not just in Idaho, but in our neighboring states provinces as well. Um, prevention, this is still a key component uh, to controlling uh, these mussels. However, for our current thing in the Snake River where we have that positive hit, uh, we've got to move from prevention into more action uh, being taken. So uh, although prevention will still be important for the rest of Idaho, uh, it's not an option currently for us. Biological controls, they are a great option uh, for established infestations. How the However, right now, um, for an eradication type control, for an, an initial early detection, rapid response type action on controlling mussels, it's not the best option. Uh, molluscicides uh, present the best option uh, for eradicating the current adult infestation, um, though there are several variables that need to be considered when you're employing this type of a tool. Um, when we were going through and kind of looking at our, our best options, we went through this entire list here looking at all of the different limiting factors. Um, both environmental as well as regulatory, um, trying to make sure we made the best decision on what was available as, as well as what would fit our current timing window. Um, and then there's also, we did a, a, a literature review to see um, where there were successes and failures um, to make sure that we could uh, not repeat mistakes and then and gain from other successes that have happened around the country. Because as you've heard mentioned, this is a, a fairly large undertaking um, in a system that hasn't had this type of a uh, reaction um, or to this scale uh, previously. So when we start looking at molluscicides, um, choices for in-water application, um, we had a couple different key active ingredients, if you will, to be able to take a look at. Um, Pseudomonas, it's a bacterium, so it's more on that biocontrol type side. Um, so it does take time. Um, and right now, for eradication, for initial taking care of these very limited number of adults, um, it's not the best option for us at this at this time. Uh, potassium chloride, um, this does take... I broke it. <laughs> Let's see if we can bring it back. Just a second, apologize. Uh, looks like full uh, on... Looks like PowerPoint's gone. Yeah, I, I, I broke it, I'm sorry. I'm not speaking another language, I promise.
get back to our CR screen here. So potassium chloride um, or it is often a, a, a common uh, potash is kind of another name for it. Um, it does take a, a high volume um, and a lar large amount to control. And then, however, it is very rapidly uptaken by uh, macrophytes and algae. And due to the high presence of algae and aquatic plant growth, it's not really going to be the best option to have a, a very high high volume of, of chemistry that we're putting into the water with being not being as um, efficient because of the high volume of the uh, bio life that's there. Naclosamide um, is another viable option, uh, but however, this product is currently not available to the U.S. Um, although there are some preliminary uh, there's some preliminary work being done by some federal agencies. Um, however, right now it's not available to us at this time, and it would take um, some emergency exemptions to be able to get it. That would take some additional time to try and get a hold of it. Um, that it doesn't really kind of fit our timeline of our narrow window that we have um, for getting this. So we looked at, at coppers. Um, we settled on chelated copper as the best option. It's registered um, within the U.S. for use, as well as having an active label that fits our use site um, of where we want to be able to use it um, at, at our target rate of nine. Uh, one part per million for a duration of 96 hours. Um, there are different formulations of copper out there, uh, both chelated copper and copper sulfate. Um, the biggest key difference is the copper sulfate um, doesn't stay in solution for as long. Um, it doesn't, it doesn't uh, carry as far as we kind of need it to. The chelated copper does allow for it to stay uh, soluble in the water for a little bit le longer of a time to help us get a f an effective control to, in the downstream that we're trying to catch. Because you remember from that picture that uh, Lloyd showed just a minute ago, how we have those villagers each day moving downstream and we want to capture them. If we have a product that only doesn't move as far, we kind of need it to move just a little bit farther to make sure we capture those downstream flowing uh, villagers. So based on the villager microscopy, um, we have three treatment areas that we have proposed at this time. Um, those primary areas being the, the Pillar or Centennial Park to Pillar Falls, Pillar Falls to Shoshone Falls, and then at the very top at the Twin Falls Deep Water Pool. Um, those are the primary target areas that we have. Um, then we're kind of preparing for a three-step type of action that we we're wanting to take as far as how do we get these muscles out of our system. Um, first is the initial one that we're, we're planning for currently um, is the copper treatments. This is our aggressive first step. Um, into trying to get these muscles controlled. Uh, we will continue to monitor after our initial copper treatments um, as we try to see if we have any other additional populations downstream, upstream, as we continue to look for it. Um, and then we can follow up with niclosamide as we can work through that process to get those emergency exemptions to get this product, working with Fish and Wildlife and other partners, to bring it in um, so we can utilize it um, as more of a sm uh, spot treatment. It does have a little bit more restrictive labeling than the copper. Um, so the use sites would have to be a lot smaller, so we couldn't cover that full area where we were having um, the, the villager movement right now. It would be much more targeted as we, as we try to get rid of these things and get them down to smaller and smaller populations. And then in the spring, uh, we're looking at utilizing the Pseudomonas bacterium, utilizing that biocontrol that's targeted to the clagum muscle um, to release that uh, inoculant in the river to help get anything else that we, we can't miss. It doesn't have the, the, the use restrictions. Um, however, it's a lot slower acting, but it's kind of like giving the, the clagger muscle a cold. Um, so we're trying to, if there's anything left that we have in spot, and it's going to be that one extra kind of little help to make sure we calmly get rid of this thing and, and not have it move anywhere else in the river system. Uh-oh. I'm dangerous. Okay. How the copper treatments work. So... For the sake of things, we have this current example of, of our flowing Snake River. Um, each section has been evaluated for the surface acreage as well as the cubic foot per second or flow rate um, of the river as well as its pH hardness or water, water hardness um, and then the average depth. Those are all very key components that we need to be able to start evaluating the treatment. Um, based on those, we, we can uh, get a rate per hour based on the, uh, the labeling and make sure that we get a quartz per hour so we can start honing in on how much of this uh, mollusk aside that we need to, to release into the river system. Um, we are going to utilize metered gravity boxes uh, that will be placed at key mix points where there's a lot of water turnover um, to help mix in our mollusk aside into the Snake River. We will then turn those on. They'll go at a very directed rate. They're not going to be just opening up the valve at the bottom 
um, of, of the container. It's, it's, it's measured out at a rate per minute. Um, and then the downstream movement will occur um, and dis, uh, distribute the mollusk aside uh, throughout the area for the full duration of 96 hours. Um, additionally, when we look at the copper treatments, uh, one of the special considerations we had to take into, uh, into consideration is the deep water pools that are present um, within these sections of the river. Um, kind of shown up here on the, this graphic, um, these areas present just a little bit of a difference because some of these are as deep as 90 feet, some are only about 20 to 25 feet deep, uh, but these are, a va if you think of them as an extra tank of water, so you have the water passing through and then you have this deep vat well um, of water that can be holdover, that's a point of dilution. So as we're sending down the one part per million trying to hit that target, these deeper er areas can be a point source of dilution and then these mussels sometimes are bottom dwelling on these rocks and if we don't have a full um, application rate in that area, we could be unsuccessful in these deeper water pools. So we're definitely taking those into consideration to make sure we can get this correct amount of this mollusk aside down to where these mussels are dwelling um, throughout the water to, uh, column of the river uh, to make sure we get them under control. The product that we are going to be using um, is, is uh, called Natrix. Um, it is labeled for use in the, this flowing water environment that we are going to be utilizing it in. Um, it is a, a copper, a chelated copper formulation, um, and we are currently in the process of getting all of it here on site and ready to go so we can uh, proceed with our, our application. So just some general information about each of these sites. Um, so the average depth of the pool at Pillar to Centennial, or excuse me, Centennial Park to Pillar uh, Falls um, is an average depth of about 15 feet, um, and then we're targeting at about um, 11,232 gallons of the product to go in, plus the one deep pool, that's the deep 90-foot pool um, at the, the head of Pillar Falls. Um, and then moving up to the Shoshone Pillar, it's an average depth of about 22 feet, um, when again, uh, at about that 11,000 gallons. And that has to do with the CFS that's within those, those areas. We don't see a lot of variability from the 480 CFS that it currently is at. There is some stream introduction as we move downstream, but however, it's pretty minimal. Um, so we're not seeing as, as high of an increase in that CFS, so both of those are looking very, very similar as far as how that application will occur. And at the very top, at the Twin Falls Deep Pool, um, it's an average depth of about 35 feet. It's a much smaller area, it's only about three acres, but we'll, we'll cover these a little bit more each in detail um, and why they are, they are how, we, how we got to these target rates. So looking at the Shoshone Falls to Pillar, I wanted to target this one first because um, as you as you saw in the map earlier where that plume was existing, that's this area. So uh, of all the areas, this is the most important area that we need to formulate treatment for. Um, it's 91, just over 91 um, acres in size, and it's between, again, Pillar Falls to Shoshone Falls. Um, we're looking at staging our, our mollusk side, both on the north and south side of um, Shoshone Falls. There's some good access there through Idaho Power as well as the Shoshone Falls Park. Why we're looking at this area is because Idaho Power does control the best mixing site available there. Um, through their inlets, they have both the, the pass-through through the hydroelectric facility um, as well as what they pass over the dam. And if you look at the very bottom of the powerhouse, you can see that turbulent white water. Think of that as a mixing point. Think of that where, where as the chemical, excuse me, goes in, it's going to mix and turn over and, and be, be at our target rate when it exits that facility and moves through that as that natural downstream movement occurs, it's all at that target rate and we can really focus in on and hone in on keeping that one part per million um, throughout the duration of that treatment. Um, and again, this reticle here is over the top of our plume area. As you heard Lloyd mention, um, Bethany Muffley and myself uh, dove down and it was a two mile haystack to try and find the needle in. Um, and we were able to find one single adult now, to give you some, some scope on this, this is no bigger than my pinky finger. Um, on the bottom of the rock, as you heard, 16 feet of water, and all of the rocks that are in the bottom of that river system and finding this, um, Bethany Muffley will forever be known as a bloodhound for finding it. She did a great job. Um, but it's, it's one of those things that as we, as we found this, what it does for us at this point is it gives us a reference. Um, when you're treating a river without a reference, when you're treating just the villagers, um, we don't have a reference. That, that takes a microscope to see those guys. We can't see them with the naked eye. Now we have a reference species that we can see, that we know where it's at. Um, 
we can review it after our treatment to make sure did we actually control it and see that we actually remove this thing from being able to continue and be um, reproducing. So some of the challenges with this site that we're trying to work through and have worked through in our plan, um, there's no access to a boat ramp. There's no way to easily get a boat into this area. Um, the ability to get the chemical in there is extremely difficult. Um, we're grateful for Idaho Power for partnering with us, mean, allowing us to use their, their intakes um, as a mixing area um, because it's a 145 foot tall cliff. Um, that's not something that you can just hand, a, hand these 275 gallon totes down through. Um, so it does propose some challenges for us on that, as well as you know, what CFS is happening. We had a little bit of rain today, so we're, you know, we want to understand what's going on with that flow because that means we have to adjust our rates. Um, and this is also the areas of highest need. Um, so kind of our, our treatment plan, how it's going to, to lay out um, is day one, um, we are going to be staging all of the, 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 the product as well as all of the mixing stations, um, getting access to these areas, making sure that we have everything in place ready to go. So that way when we get ready to turn on essentially those metered um, totes with the metered rates, um, we're, we're doing all the pre-work first, getting that all set, going through with the team, having briefings, making sure that he's up to speed. Then days two through five, once we crack the valve open, it's a 96-hour continuous treatment. That's four days. So once we hit start, there's no stop. We have to continually make sure we keep that rate going across that entire time to be effective against these muscles. Um, so we'll, we'll do that, that treatment. Then we'll take a very short break to kind of restack, rehash, get all the equipment re uh, replaced um, to get ready to go for round two um, on day six and seven. So that's going to, be, uh, once we have that all done, then on day eight through 12, we'll start again. This area is going to receive two treatments. And the reason for that is the easiest way to explain it is when you think of that quagga muscle, um, they have taste buds just like we do in a, in a way they're sensitive to different tastes, they're, they're selective feeders. Um, so if something is someone trying to get them something uh, that they don't like, they close up. Kind of like my kid when I try to give them broccoli. They just close their mouth, they're not going to hold it. So we're trying to make sure there's enough contact time with that copper so that it will open back up, start feeding again, and take that dose of the copper within itself um, and then expire. Um, so we need to have that, that length of time because these guys can't hold their breath. They can, they can uh, remain closed. And that 96 hour gives us enough time to make sure that it, it can take in um, a full lethal dose um, of that copper. And some studies did show that it takes a little bit longer than 96 hours if you want to be effective. However, the labeling um, requires that the length of time that we can go to the maximum at is, is 96 hours. So by taking that break, we're giving it some time to make sure we're following the label, following all the restrictions that we have in place, and then starting again with another 96 hours to make sure we have that full contact time and we're not giving these uh, little guys an opportunity to persist. We're going to make sure that we, we catch them all. Um, and then at the end of that treatment, uh, on day 13, we will then uh, remove all the application equipment, pull it all out of that site in that area, and then back to regular scheduled programming in that, that area as far as monitoring and checking, continue to make sure we don't have any additional introductions of, of quagga muscle. Um, the next section downstream from that is Pillar Falls to Centennial. This is 118 uh, surface acres. Uh, the, our main staging site that we're selected is at the uh, Centennial Park there that it, that area is really kind of becoming our main hub, our main our main station because of its ease of access. Um, it's going to prevent a little bit of a challenge. Uh, we did some on-site evaluations uh, this last Tuesday trying to determine where flow was coming from, flow rates. This does have the deepest pool at 90 feet. Um, so it's one of those things that we were, as we were looking and evaluating this site, we wanted to make sure that we um, really set our mix sites at and it doesn't have a, a, a dam controlled facility. So there's no place to put it in, in, in through an intake. It's a natural feature, so we have to try and pick a, a site accordingly that's going to have enough natural feature mixing occurring um, so we can place our totes uh, for those mixed sites. There we go. So this is a picture um, as of yesterday. We did place three totes in, in preparation for getting ready for the treatment. Um, as you can see, there's that pour over feature right there at the very bottom of Pillar Falls. That provides enough in, you know, water inundation to, to drive that mix down, downward. Um, and then we have two, two additional totes um, just over the top of that sign that's floating there at Pillar Falls. There's one and two. They're directly behind each other, both capitalizing on having those tote placements be where that's the highest area of flow and mixing is occurring. Um, 
and the, the, as far as the treatment outlay goes, day one, again, setting up all that, that equipment, getting everything in place, days two through five, that 96 hour treatment, and then day six, we're removing. This area is only going to receive one treatment uh, because we haven't, there's no establishment of adult muscles. It's mostly the villagers passing through. However, we are just as concerned with this area because the villagers have been moving through and their life cycle is as such that as they grow and develop, they'll eventually settle out. So we wanna make sure we're capturing these villagers in this area where we have a higher number in case there have been any settling out uh, villagers um, and they're starting to grow their shell. They're, they're pretty susceptible right now. Um, so we wanna target this area to make sure uh, we get those under control. The last area is the Twin Falls Deep Pool. Um, this area on, on the map that Lloyd showed, um, had this is the area, the pool that had the highest number of villagers. Um, and then above this point, there's nothing. So if we have a deep pool where we're having villagers um, constantly coming up for multiple tests, um, and then in that point upwards, it just kind of targeted that we really needed to target this smaller area because we don't know where the, they're, we couldn't find an existing plume. So we don't know where they're coming from so we want to target this area specifically because there may be a hidden muscle that we can't see. Um, it's because of the deep pool, we might not be getting our villager nets down deep enough to identify that plume. So we wanted to make sure we really honed in um, on this area. We did talk with Idaho Power. They are going to allow us to stage at their facility as well as pass that chemical through um, their facility. So in case there's any biofouling, uh, we can collect that and make sure that it falls under, our, under control. And Additionally with that, yes, we, we anticipate the copper is going to move downstream through the rest of that area between Twin Falls and Shoshone Falls. However, it's going to be diluting as it picks up an additional 100 CFS within that area. Um, and it will, But it'll be still be lethal to the villagers that may be potentially be in that area as the, through that downstream movement. As this one is going to go, as far as the treatment plan, this one's going to start on day seven of our, of our calendar because we're going to treat Pillar Falls, or Centennial to Pillar Falls, from Pillar Falls to Shoshone in the first treatment. And then our second treatment is going to then be the Twin Falls Deep Pool, and then again, that Pillar Falls to Shoshone Falls area. Um, so that's why there's a day seven on here um, that will be staging things, days eight through 12, that's that startup, that 96 hours, um, that will receive the mollusk aside, and then day 13, we'll remove all that equipment. Okay, now the biggest question that we've been receiving a lot of is what happens to all that copper that we're introducing for those treatment times, and it starts to move downstream. This downstream movement is, is a good thing. Again, remember that map where we saw that downstream movement of these villagers. We're trying to capture those so that way if we treated just where we had active villagers today, um, with these things putting out the level of villagers that they are anywhere from 82 to 2,000 um, villager larvae a day, those are going to be moving downstream naturally with the water. So if we don't do something to address that, we'll be back here again uh, next year trying to address Chicago Muscle again because we let these, we didn't do enough to address their downstream spread. Um, so we're trying to capture that with this downstream movement. Um, what we've kind of done is we have been working very closely trying to figure out how far down based on a, a number of variables, how far is it going to go, um, as well as trying to find out where's the areas of highest uh, impact on, uh, on that downstream movement. Um, so we did take an entire survey of this entire 16 mile area shown on this map and looked for a lot of sensitive areas, whether that's you know, trout farms, um, irrigation intakes, drinking water intakes, things of those nature, trying to see if there's any of those types of high risk areas in there, because we were looking at the option of employing biochar or activated charcoal to pull the copper out um, in those areas of sensitivity. The only areas that we were able to identify um, were some, some access areas for um, livestock um, to be able to go down to the river and drink from the, the river, um, the, the uh, level that we're using the copper is non-toxic to like cattle and things like that. There are copper sensitive species out there um, that we can address and, and talk about uh, a little bit down the road. Um, but however, we still wanted to identify where those areas at were at where stock can access. This was one of two uh, that we found where they were actually able to go in and access that water. So we identified them so we can start to evaluate you know, what, what uh, stock is there, how are they using the water, when are they, you know, is it a grazing allotment, is it a established farm or ranch. Um, so we, we did collect that information um, and didn't see any other areas of impact. All of the trout fisheries have a waterfalling type feature. So there's separation from our river as and the, where their trout fisheries are that could be susceptible to the copper. So there's no way for that water to exchange up the waterfall and kind of go into their facilities. So they're protected, um, which is a really great design feature of them. Um, and then a lot of their settling ponds have those. Um, so they're, they're protected. They're not gonna be affected by our copper treatments as far as uh, water 
um, intakes and things of that nature. Our levels of uh, one part per million are well below the threshold for drinking water, so there's no drinking water restrictions as well as no irrigation restrictions. Um, it, copper is a very commonly uh, used formulation that is used in irrigation and canal districts uh, to control algae and other things um, within those systems, so it's, it's going to be uh, there's a, an area of non-effect uh, within those. So um, the copper is estimated to disseminate and dissipate breakdown in the system in a 14 to 16 mile area, um, which if you think of as, at the, as from the bottom end of Centennial, where the Highway 46 bridge um, crosses over the snake, that's right there near that, uh, is it Canyon Springs Golf Course, uh, that's just downstream from that, that bridge. Um, and so in that area, there's a total, uh, even though it looks narrow on the map, it's a total of about 739 surface acres. That's a very important number to keep in mind, because we're not just talking about water, we're also talking about algae and the macrophytes, as well as others, key components that are going to help break this copper down as it moves down. But it has to go through a lot of areas. Even though you know length isn't that big, um, the, the amount of um, area is, is, is a good large uh, spread. Um, so how's it going to break down as it moves downstream? First and foremost, the biggest contributing factor that's going to lead to the breakdown is going to be additional water. Um, you know, whether that's from springs or streams or irrigation returns that are coming back down into the, into the Snake River, each of these adds to that component of the, the cubic feet per second of the volume of water moving down and adds as a dilution. And that area of you know, where we're letting that, that copper go, as that dilution increases, that naturally breaks down that copper um, amount in the water, starts to really kind of take it out of the system, make it fall, start below, uh, starting to fall below those lethal levels. Um, also, what we can't see is also all of the subsurface springs that we know that are coming up in that canyon as well, that are kind of welling up and coming up from all the different sources from here to Thousand Springs. There's, lo there's thousands of springs coming in and helping to add to that dilution factor. Um, one thing to keep in mind is at the very top end at the, the, uh, the Twin Falls uh, facility, it's a total CFS of 380 CFS. At the very bottom end of our 16-mile area, it is at 2,010 CFS, so that is quite the compounding of dilution occurring naturally through all the introduction of additional water into the system. Um, what we're ex anticipating that that process alone is going to do is break the copper down and dilute it down by more than 70%. So we're at one part per million, we're reducing it by you know 70% just in additional water addition as well. Another print, uh, thing that's going to help pull the, make the copper not bioavailable um, are available for other organisms to take it at a lethal dose um, is plants and algae. Um, they, they do like to um, sorb and bring in that copper. Um, it, it is lethal to the plant um, when it brings that copper in. That's why a lot of irrigation districts and things like that use it is to help remove copper or plants and algae. However, once it's taken in by that plant, it's no longer bioavailable. It's not available in the system to be lethal to anything else. It's, it's removed from that system. So what we kind of did on an initial study, because this is really kind of hard to quantify and say exactly what happened or, or how much plant and algae we have um, in that area, but kind of based on some imagery and things of that nature and some infield um, surveys that we were able to collect, we were able to say that within the first 9.5 miles, um, the, or roughly the Pigeon Cove area, we're going to lose an additional 5 to 15% of that copper. It's only going to be bioavailable. And so that's, it, it, I realize that is a range, um, but again, that's just how much algae do we have, how much um, plant macrophyte do we have, um, and at this time, as we're starting to move into the winter months, how much of that plant is still respiring and able to bring that copper into its receptor sites. And so it's kind of what, that's why we were giving that range, is we, the plants are varied uh, throughout here. We know there are certain areas that are just full of plants, other areas are not so much. Um, so, but it's a, a good sweep to, to talk about and say that it's going to help pull it out. Another way that is um, going to help pull the copper out um, is in it organic matter sorption um, or complexation. So think of sorption as uh, the free-floating sediments. We have a lot of sediments uh, that get stirred up as the river moves downstream, as you get new additional um, inflows from the side or from underneath, you get some sand and silt moving around. We don't have a lot of clays moving around, but we do have a lot of sand and silt. Um, there's not as much room in those sand and silt uh, free-floating um, hydrosoils, um, but we're anticipating at least a, a 2% um, decrease in the copper available just due to the, that there is some available for it to take and bind to that copper and move it out of the system. 
The other has to do with our pH level, um, alkalinity, as well as our water heart, kind of our water general on water hardness. Um, what that does for us is on species that we're concerned with, like fish, their main area that is sensitive to copper is their gills. Um, and the potassium and the sodium that's present in the hard water um, kind of blocks those receptor sites on the fish's gills and doesn't allow the copper to be bioavailable to them so they, they can take a little bit higher dose of the copper and not have it be lethal to them. Um, so, but, and then additionally, um, we'll also see some of that with that hard, hardness water, we'll see it kind of binding in different sites um, to, because it's a complex, it's not just you know, sodium and potassium, there's, there's calcium, there's others that'll help bind that copper and help make it not bioavailable on downstream. So this is going to be about five to 10% additionally. Um, that's going to help pull that copper out in the dissemination area. So what does that, what does that all mean? So at the low end, if we take those, I know I've spoken some ranges on some of those, some are more of a definitive number, some were ranges. If we put that all together on the low end, we're estimating that by the end of that 16 mile area, 82% um, of that copper is going to be broken down. And what that equates to is about 0.12 parts per million. That's well below our, our lethal levels um, for you know, fish is between four and six parts, or 0.4 and 0.6 parts per million. Um, and then, so we're, we're well below that, that mark for the fish. Um, and for our target of the villagers, that's about 0.2 parts per million. And so this then starts to fall below that level as well, where we're not seeing any additional villagers on downstream. Um, on the high end, it's, a, it's about 97% breakdown um, and at 0 0.1 or 0 0.1.0 or 0.10 parts per million, excuse me. Um, that, so it's breaking down quite, quite well by that point that it's really, really below all the lethal levels that we're, we're kind of monitoring and looking for. That said, we're still gonna be looking. We're still going to be monitoring that downstream copper as we go down and follow that plume down, making sure it is breaking down how we expect it to within that area and monitor it um, consistently throughout the duration of the treatment area and after. Now, once we turn that copper off um, at the very top and are no longer introducing copper into the system, we're anticipating about two to three days after shut it off to, for it to fully start moving out of the system. So it's not gonna take a, a lot of additional time because we're not continuing to introduce more and more copper. Now we have fresh water coming in, which is more dilution and going to help move that copper out even faster after we shut it off. Um, so, and again, about two to three days after that, we'll start to see that copper uh, move out of the system. So, dates. This is the, the overall treatment schedule. This is how we're going to be taking this thing out. I know you kind of talked in days first. Now here's the dates. Um, for phase one, October 3rd, that's this Tuesday, um, we will start treatment on the Centennial Park to Pillar Falls, Pillar Falls to Shoshone Falls areas. Um, we are going to be targeting that 96 hour, one part per million treatment. Um, and it will continue for that full duration of 96 hours until October 7th. Um, at that point, we will then clean up the cent Centennial Park to Pillar Falls treatment area and then start pre preparing for our treat second treatment of the uh, Pillar Falls to Shoshone as well as the Twin Falls. That will be uh, phase two and treatment two um, that will start on October 9th. So two days after the commencement of the first. Um, We'll start our second treatment of those, those areas. Um, again, it's gonna be another 96 hour treatment um, ending on October the 13th. And then clean up and all the breakdown of all of our supplies will be collected and we'll remove them off site and be done by October 14th. So, this year. Yeah, I can go through. Yeah. Sure, as far as treatment notifications, um, we have been making sure that we've been talking about this. It's been coming up. We've had a lot of working groups with this. Um, brought a lot of state and federal managers in here um, and broadcasted a lot of information out there trying to get as far and wide, both bilingual um, information as well to ensure that people know what's going on um, through different advertisements, different coordination efforts, um, as well as we are starting to work on some door knocking and stake, you know, making sure that stakeholders know what's going on. Um, and then bringing, and then here we are today for the public uh, treatment town hall briefing um, as a part of this notification process for this treatment. And with that, Okay, before we take some of these questions, I just want to, so we just went through the, the really technical version of this. So number one, um, what we are doing tonight is being recorded, so that's something that you can share if, if somebody wasn't able to join us. 
Uh, the presentation that Jeremy went through is also going to be posted to our website. So I know I saw a lot of folks taking pictures. If you need information from that slideshow, it's going to be available. But I do kind of want to bring it back to the, the high-level overview of this project, and we need to talk about some serious impacts that we are going to be facing as well. That might be part of some of the questions I got. So, so number one, you all um, understand now what we're trying to do with the clogger muscles, and as aggressive as this treatment is, we are still utilizing a rate of product that is below a drinking rate standard. So yes, it affects, and, and we all have to, to put our science hats back on. Jeremy talked about uh, an adult muscle the size of a, a pinky nail. That is going to um, respond to toxicity different than a human, different than um, adult cattle, those sorts of things. So we would encourage people to ask questions when they have them, and I'm gonna go through a list a little bit. But um, we don't want everyone to conflate the fact that we are treating with the river with the, it's not going to affect everything the same way that it affects clogger muscles. We are gonna go through impacts just a little bit though. Um, and before I do that, I do wanna set the stage. Um, Jeremy talked about how difficult the, um, how difficult it is in Shoshone Falls right now. We are going to be airlifting boats into Shoshone Falls tomorrow. So please don't be alarmed if you see two boats being airlifted into the area. It's gonna be early in the morning. But that is the only way that we can access that area, move the product around like we need to, and also ensure that we are doing the testing that we just talked to you about, that we're, we're hitting it at exactly the rate that is going to affect the muscles, not every, affect everything else. So a lot of measuring, a lot of double checking, um, and we're not the only ones who are gonna be taking measurements, and we can talk about that a little bit. But we need to talk about the impact of the treatment. So you know what we're gonna try to do with clogger muscles, and to set the stage, um, this is, we're talking about treating less than 1% of the Snake River. Yes, this is a massive project, but when you talk about the active treatment area, this is less than 1% of the Snake River. We uh, don't expect any impact to drinking water. The nearest drinking water intake is down in Glens Ferry, and we've had conversations about that. There are not drinking water intakes here in the impact area, so this is not something um, that you're hearing us talk about because it's not going to be an issue. Let's talk about aquatic species. Jeremy talked about macrophytes um, and algae. You guys probably know if you've been in this area for a long time, if you love the river, you spend time on it. There's quite a bit of organic matter in this river. And so it is going to be impacted by this treatment, as will fish. And what we want to do really um, vocally and to set expectations now, and it's something we started doing when we had talks last week with county commissioners, and it's what I tried to cue up at the beginning of this discussion. If we do nothing, it is worse for the river. But we want everyone to understand that this treatment doesn't come without downsides. And there will be fish mortality in the area where we are treating. And we have, a, have, have been working with the Department of Fish and Game about what that fish mortality looks like. And we know the department has been out doing fish surveys. Um, and we expect the, the greatest amount of mortality to occur where we are implementing that treatment that we just all talked about. Um, and what those fish surveys with the fishing game are gonna do is help set some benchmarks and help them understand what future um, stocking looks like. And so this is a plan that hasn't been you know, created in a silo. Um, in fact, we spent Friday down on the river with many, many agencies. And we're gonna, I think Sydney's got a slide for us queued up to talk about some of the, the partners that we've been working with. This, this plan wasn't developed in a silo. We didn't do it by ourselves. Um, and it's also important to note, and Jeremy touched on this, this product isn't unprecedented. This product is commonly used, and copper-based products like this are commonly used in irrigation by other states as herbicides to control other species. So we don't, you know, we are talking about it because we all understand the clogger situation and the scale. But this is not something, uh, this is something that happens frequently that you probably never realize, but it is occurring in irrigation systems and other systems in this state and around the country regularly. But we want to be very transparent about what's gonna happen in the Snake River. Um, in terms of other impacts too, uh, for wildlife, we, we even visited with the Fish Consumption Advisory Committee, and you guys probably didn't even know we had one of those, but we do. And it is a, a multi-agency effort to understand what might affect uh, fish consumption for the state. So if you're someone who loves fishing, if you, you, know, you obviously want to understand what this treatment is going to do, there's going to be fish mortality, but what about the other fish? And what about animals that feed on fish? And what we um, have noted is, um, in working with the advisory committee, it is not expected that this type of product settles in the flesh of fish. 
is expected to pass over the gills, so it will affect, uh, affect fish in the impact area. But if there were a bird that came along and ate you know, the, the flesh of the fish, that is not a wildlife concern um, that we have, and we've talked about that with a lot of different groups. But we can continue to talk about it. Um, I want to look through my notes and just see if there's anything else we need to cover. Um, let's talk about outreach just a little bit, Sydney, and then I'm going to launch into questions. Can you queue up that slide for us, or maybe I need to? It's a ways back. We went through a lot of, we covered a lot of ground. Um, but we told you, oh, don't look at the screen, it's going to make you motion sick. Uh, there we go. Okay, so when I say we haven't done this in a silo, and we have been reacting really, really quickly, we're not cutting corners. And we're trying to bring in every single group that could poke holes in this, question it, help us understand and get to a better, better answer. And I can't thank the local jurisdictions here. So the, the, the Twin Falls County Commissioners, the Jerome County Commissioners, the, the City of Twin Falls and Madam Mayor and City Council members who have been with us um, truly since uh, about an hour after we told the governor. I think the county commissioners and I are now on speed dial with each other and we talk so often. Um, this is complex. And again, none of us wanted to be here. This is the this is the option that we have to try to save our water resources. So it is what we're trying. These are the partners that we have been working with. Um, in addition, of course, as I mentioned, and a huge thanks to our, our local leadership in Twin Falls, who not only knew about this issue but knew the severity of it and have been trying to help us navigate how to deploy an effective treatment. Um, but working with all of these entities as well to try to make sure that we have poked holes in things as much as we can, that we're getting to a treatment that is hopefully going to be effective and has had a lot of eyes on it. So with that, let's get to some questions really quickly, if that's okay, Sydney. And if, if you've got more, um, let's go through. Okay. Are all boats required to be decontaminated or just the ones that have been in affected waters? That's a great question. So we've been so fortunate in Idaho that we haven't had to deal with affected waters up until this point. Right now, what we are telling folks is from Twin Falls Dam to Niagara Springs, if you have been in there, and we started this on September 18th, so the clock started on September 18th, had you been in there in the previous 30 days, to come and see us for a free decontamination wash. We really don't want folks hot wash, or well, don't wash your own boats, because number one, you might send that material into a storm drain or something else but you can't probably get it hot enough to be effective. We have special machines that get really hot to be effective, um, but if you were in Milner, we encourage everyone, you're outside of the affected area, but we always encourage everyone, clean, drain, dry your boats. We've been saying that for the last 15 or 16 years, that continues, and I think all of us are probably gonna have a renewed sense of vigilance of how important it is. Um, we also need to get the word out, and I don't know if there's anyone from tourism here tonight, we really need to get the word out to the folks who come and enjoy our waters from somewhere else and then leave. Because we um, are dealing with this impact, we need everyone to be following those same directions. Okay. Yep, okay, great question. How effective have similar water treatments been in other areas? That's great, and I'll, I'll let Jeremy and Lloyd weigh in too. We have seen, I, I mentioned to you the Colorado example where it took them about six months to deploy a treatment where we're going to take about two weeks. Their results so far have been good. They have not found villagers, and, and uh, Jeremy can correct me on that if we need to. Um, so I'm going to kick it over to them, but let me take the other part of this question really quickly. So uh, can and how, you know, could livestock basically spread the muscles? So the one thing that we have working for us typically is if, and we know we have some, some livestock access to water, typically those animals aren't um, here and then really, really quickly moving over to Milner. So that is going to work in our, our favor that it's not exactly like somebody with an inflatable raft, a kayak, or a boat where you, you drop in water, you have a great time one day, and then you decide to go upriver, or you portage into a spot upriver pretty quickly. So that is, um, I think, a different risk level typically, but again, we're trying to be pretty mindful of any livestock access, but it's, it's limited. They're going to be in that impact area post-treatment, but not necessarily in this uh, direct treatment area. But let's talk about effectiveness of treatments as well. If I could, before we get, let Jeremy talk about some of those other treatments, one thing to think about with these villagers is the villagers at that stage themselves are relatively, are, are actually very fragile. Um, you've heard us talk about clean, drain, dry, and the reason for that is 
we know that if a watercraft leads a, leaves a heavily infested area, like we've always talked about the lower Colorado, for instance, um, we know there's times of the year that studies have shown that there's a time period in the time that that boat has left that water, depending on weather, temperature, um, water chemistry, et cetera, et cetera, that those villagers have a limited lifespan. And the wash that we do looks simple enough, but temperature and time, contact with the surface, contact with where the wet areas are for those villagers are very important because they are very sensitive to heat, they're very sensitive to pressure, they're very sensitive to a number of environmental things. So when you hear us talk about 30 days and you hear us talk about washing, it's because we know that especially with those villagers, um, they are very fragile and susceptible to a lot of things that could impact them. Um, Jeremy can talk about some other treatments, but one of the scenarios that the director mentioned was in Colorado. Another scenario was in Montana. They never actually treated because they found villagers, they never found adults. And they went through five years after that and never saw anything again. It's very possible, we've always assumed, that there could be dozens of introductions of villagers into Idaho waters every year that never take for whatever reason, right? Um, well, I mean, that's a... I would say a hypothetical exercise that we go through. It's a what-if scenario. We it, build plans it is. around not saying that happens. No, it is. No, but I'm <laughs> okay. We're a little, yeah. It is, but but my point being that that you know, the villagers are fragile enough that they just because one's introduced doesn't mean something's going to take. So there's some instances where treatments have been done for villagers, some have been done for adults, and each scenario is a little bit different. Jeremy, I'll let you go from there. One of the key important things to keep in mind is when we start talking treatments, most of the folks that have been treating for, for quagga or its secondary cousin, uh, zebra mussels, uh, when I was doing the literature review, a lot of them were in established sites. So sites that have had these uh, introductions since the, the, the late 80s. Um, and there's a vast quantity of them, and they're, they're doing trials and initial trials on them with a very established um, population of those mussels. Some have been very successful in what are very controlled environments. Um, others, they have tried different things that haven't worked and been trying to figure out what works, what doesn't. Um, to our knowledge, there has never been anything done at the scale at which we are doing here in the Snake River. Um, but however, utilizing the copper to control them has been very successful. Um, that's what we're, we're, we're really looking at this product, really looking at the success rates of utilizing a copper-based product uh, that has the correct labeling um, so we didn't we'll get any additional emergency type um, permitting. Um, and this one does pair up showing a very good beneficial results of treatments um, in, in various areas from canal ditches to intakes on hydroelectric facilities um, and things of those natures that they have worked, they've worked very successfully. Um, where we're taking more of a proactive EDR or early detection rapid response type approach and trying to get rid of this thing before it has the opportunity to fully establish um, we're kind of on the, on the front edge of that because now we, we've identified it, we've been able to catch it early enough. We have samples um, from, from Nick uh, with, with his program and the surveying that you saw, saw the images of, of being able to show it wasn't here before, now it's here, so how do we now address it um, while it's in its infancy, if you will, um, in, in, a, in infestation. So it's, we're trying to get it right at the start. Um, and those have shown to be very, very successful um, when you're treating very small quantities and trying to attack just a, a, a very start of a population and not a very well-established population. So one, so one of the questions that we talked about earlier, too, is um, so we addressed the question, but one of the notes on here was that some of our information online about boat decon is a little bit confusing. So if, if you're willing to share, if you're willing to be brave, come find us afterwards, too. We want to make sure that that information makes sense to folks. If there's things that we can do to make it better, we would like to do that. So if, if you um, don't mind coming to visit with us, we would be, I would be curious. Okay, perfect, good. Come come find us and we'll try to, let's let's make sure it makes sense for folks. Yeah, thank you. Th and thank you, um, I hope everyone knows the intent of this isn't for us just to, to, to preach to everyone and then walk away and say, boy, wasn't a stakeholder meeting great. It's truly to get some input from people. So please let us know about things like that. We've got a number of other questions. Um, one of the things, it kind of follows what we talked about with livestock, that do, our li do livestock pose a threat for moving, moving muscles? I mean, obviously anything that comes in contact with the water could pose a threat, but if those livestock continue to graze in that same area, 
that looks different than somebody, again, who is taking a, a inflatable raft or even, and, and this is really important to understand, even fishing tackle, duck decoys. If you are in a part of the water where you were, you were um, really excited about going fishing and then you go, um, you know, drive up to Milner and decide to fish, you have to understand, yes, we found uh, an adult muscle, but the, the matter that we're talking about is microscopic. You would never know that you have quagga mussel villagers on your boat. You cannot see them. And so it's really, really important to think about anything that comes in contact or if you let your dog go splash around in the water and have a great time. Uh, we don't want to be, you know, we don't want to make this um, seem silly, but it truly is important to then not go into another water body. Um, okay, let's go keep going with the questions because they're great. Thank you. Um, we want to talk about rain's effect on treatment. I'm going to kick this over to Jeremy because this is a conversation we have had a lot. We have built in a lot of contingencies into our planning, and I'll let Jeremy talk about uh, the CFS specifically. So we've, we've had a pretty good rain today. It's been a, been a good rainy day, and so what does that mean to our treatment area? Um, so the, the volume, it's more about what, what really is the volume that comes off of that rain. And so although we may see you know, an in increase some of the water falling, the waterfalls that are falling off the canyon from collecting all the storm water or other things like that, and you see some additional water. As far as it means for the cubic feet per second flow rate of the, the river in the section that we're looking at treating, it's fairly minimal. We're maybe only talking a swing of a few CFS. It's not going to make a very large difference. If we're talking a large swing in CFS, it's going to be from something else, uh, either a cataclysmic rain event or um, something that's being a, a change in flow from dams or things of that, that nature. It's not going to be as wide of a sweep, we are expecting it to come up and then start to then tail out um, after the storm starts to move through. We have made contingencies so we can accurately measure that uh, the level of CFS as we start to start our treatment. So if we need to make any adjustments, we have built that in um, to our models for how we're going to be putting this chemical out. And we have a product on site to make sure we can make those adjustments should we get enough water um, being introduced um, that could cause additional dilution of our copper. Um, so, I mean, it's, it is something that we were watching and monitoring, but at this time, the, the introductions of the rain haven't been enough to really cause that big of a swing to cause us not being able to be able to be, to be able to do our treatment. Um, we can still mitigate and make sure that we're not, uh, that we we're still able to hit that target one part per million. Jeremy, can the treatment be monitored for stratification um, and, and identify the eventual efficacy? How, how do we evaluate whether it's going to work or not? I mean, you're getting the concentrations every way you move. Right. So, so when it comes to the, the the treatment in the water, it's not just a broadcast on the top of the water. And you know, we know that the water, especially like we were talking about those deep pool areas where you have a deeper pool, that we have to be able to address that larger vat of water. Um, we know at times that there can be um, different. Uh, Temperatures at different levels throughout that water column that sometimes can kind of hold a thermocline or hold the colder waters will stay down and the warmer waters do something different on top. Um, we have made sure that we uh, address that and how we're going to apply the chemical, making sure that on you know, some of the drip totes are going to have deeper lead hoses going down as far as we can get them uh, through gravity feed to introduce that and make sure we're constantly and consistently getting it. We also took temperature readings and already found out that uh, the pool at Pillar Falls has already flipped. Um, so the cooler waters are now on top and the warmer waters are now on, uh, underneath. And so kind of finding out that base information, we've been kind of really exploring that. We have water meters on hand. We've been working with USGS on that, getting active information for what the CFS are doing. And then as far as monitoring that effectiveness as it starts to move downstream, making sure we don't have just a top layer versus a bottom layer, we do have sampling devices on site uh, to be able to run a copper colorimeter so we can take uh, a camera device send it down, it only collects water when you send down the trap, and so it collects the water at, at, um, at the depth that you want, um, so that way we can check the really deep pools, make sure where we are at one part per million when we bring that up so we can make adjustments as needed. I mean, so throughout the duration of the treatment, we're going to be heavily monitoring and making sure that we are hitting our target level, uh, making sure it's being effective. Um, we also have that, uh, that adult muscle uh, that we found um, we call it our canary in the cage. We have gone down, um, attached some mesh to it so it can't get away from us, um, and tied it off so that way we can then go back and make sure we can go review it to make sure we are being effective. It is taking in that lethal dose um, to, a very, to an adult muscle. Um, so we are being very, very 
I think a very, very programmatic approach to this, making sure we're, we're checking off each step uh, along the way to be as effective as possible um, throughout all the varying water conditions that we know that we have from the Twin Falls deep pool all the way down to the bottom end of Sig Tech. I, I uh, had a question texted to me from my kids at home and asked me how you can tell if it's dead, and I said, you're just going to poke it. <laughs> well, we will have to go back down and get it and retrieve it, but you'll be able to tell through the internal t the, the internal tissues um, whether or not it's opening and respiring. Uh, they, they, they do have the, they are a bivalve, um, so we'll be able to see whether or not it's opening and respiring and breathing like a fish does in the water. Um, we'll be able to tell whether or not it's, it's a dead, just open, and doesn't look very happy. It doesn't have X's on the eyes, unfortunately. So You don't just ask it if it's dead? No, it tells no, you. it doesn't tell me it's feelings. Okay, so we do have a couple other questions related to DNA that I'll, I'll try to tackle, and they're good questions, and, and I think this is probably an area that I, I would imagine the, the real answer is there's a lot more research to do. One is, is there any way to perform DNA analysis to establish the diversity um, how closely related are the populations? When we do, when we get, you, you heard me talk about um, when we send uh, po uh, results that are positive under microscopy for, for genetic confirmation, they do a very simple test just to see if it's the species that we're concerned with. There's two species that we're concerned with, quagga and zebra mussel. Um, I don't know that they've done, uh, somebody probably is, I don't know that they have the option or have done enough research to be able to differentiate between quagga mussels from the Great Lakes to those that are in uh, the Colorado River to somewhere else. I know that we know how those have moved across the country. We know from whence they came originally uh, in Eastern Europe and, and Ukraine. I don't know that anybody's pinned down if we have any anything that's genetically unique of one population over another if they're quagga mussels. Um, is it and in the same vein, is it possible to compare DNA to other regions to understand where they originated? You know, that would probably be a great um, CSI Twin Falls series for us to have. I don't know that they have that capability, though, and, and it's something I guess we could ask. Um, you know, we get asked a lot about, you know, not just now, but, but anytime something like this comes up, do you know where it came from? And, and really, there's no way for us to know. We know what some potential pathways are. Um, but that would just be that would just be hypothetical, you know, guessing that any of us could do around the kitchen table or, or elsewhere, um, you know, in trying to guess where these things came from. I think the most important thing is we know that it's a quagga mussel. Uh, quagga mussels are there in some in some number in some form, and and we need to get get rid of them. Uh, where they came from, how genetically, it is a curious question, and I have a feeling that after we get done with this and and we will present what we've done to, to some of our colleagues around the country. I'm sure there'll be some discussion um, about that. Also, there was a question here about um, ingestion of mussels by wildlife birds in particular, and can they um, disperse these throughout the environment? There's always a lot of questions about that because people see that movement that waterfowl move from water body to water body and assume they can carry something with them. And certainly I think that's probably, again, a hypothetical possibility. I don't know that anybody's ever ever been able, excuse me, been able to, to you know, point a definitive finger at at waterfowl movement as being something that is is known to convey. Um, you know, one thing about these, especially the distribution we we think that we have in the in the work that we've done in the last couple of weeks, um, you know, this one muscle is you know 15, 16 feet down. Um, you know, is there going to be regular feeding there that they'll feed on those sharp mussel um, organisms and, and ingest them and take them somewhere else? Um, if the mussel itself, remember what I said about the villagers being fragile, and I'm going to assume just from, from what I know about digestion of a lot of stuff, what we all learn in, in science class, I'm going to assume the villagers won't make it through that. That's a bit hypothetical, Director, so I won't get out on my science branch. I could feel her tense up. Um, she hadn't kicked me yet. Uh, yet. But um, the adults, when, when, when you hear people talk about and see pictures of the, of the shorelines at the Great Lakes, for instance, you know, those, they have thousands of those there, and they're very sharp, and they're something that I would imagine none of us in the animal kingdom would probably have much interest in, in playing with. Um, they're, they're pretty nasty little critters. They're, 
They're filter feeders. There's a lot of things about them I would, I would imagine um, aren't real attractive, which would go to the next question that is always one that's asked a little bit in jest, which is good for a room like this since we've been so serious. Uh, if we ever had an infestation thick enough, which of course we're not trying, we're trying very hard not to have, uh, I wouldn't recommend scraping them off and boiling them for, for some sort of stew or soup. Again, they're a filter feeder. There's by, by their very nature, it's why I don't eat liver either, but by their very nature, there's going to be probably a lot of toxins and pollutants in there that, that we wouldn't want to deal with. Am I okay? <laughs> Apparently, Lloyd's an ornithologist now. Um, you gave me the question. <laughs> but, but, but you can tell that we are trying to apply the absolute best data that we can find and also marry it up with a little bit of common sense at the same time. And so that's where, that's where you get, and that's why we have so many eyes on this project. And uh, I, did, I did get something uh, sent in via text, which would be that we would be remiss if we didn't uh, shout out the, the fact that the lab that we use, and again, Lloyd talked about, about microscopy and genetic confirmation, they have been working around the clock. They have cleared the deck for Idaho only and they have been, and, and so many other folks have done that too, to create bandwidth for us um, and, and to help us. And I think one of the groups that isn't on here is uh, Office of Emergency Management who is helping us to, to be able to respond this quickly. There are countless partners who know that we're working at this lightning pace and have said, all right, we'll, we'll get you what you need and, and we couldn't thank them enough. And um, I don't know that we have any more questions coming in, Sydney, unless you have some and we can, we can take some from the audience. But, um, I have to tell you guys, um, I, I don't know what everybody's interaction is with state government, and if you've heard this story from me before, I apologize, but I grew up in a small town. I think Lloyd and Jeremy are, are in the same boat. Uh, I didn't, I, and I don't throw anything, but I grew up in a small town in Oregon, um, but it was farm country, and my part of Oregon always felt, first of all, more like Idaho, but it felt a million miles away from people who were in agencies in Salem making decisions. And I have carried that chip in my, on my shoulder for a really long time. And that might be some of the questions you guys have. Uh, you know, how seriously are folks taking it? The, the people who are involved with this program, first of all, many of them have been here for a really long time, but they live this stuff and breathe it. We, we took a number of groups down the river on Friday, and it was great to have everyone sort of captive on a boat so we could talk about the scale and the magnitude of what we were trying to do, how much people truly care about getting a, getting a good outcome here for, for neighbors, people who live here, for all of us who love the river in the same way. And uh, I, can't, I can't say enough about the ISDA staff who literally at this point are pretty much living on the river. Jeremy, you guys don't know this, Jeremy is going to take a tent out to one of the islands and camp out during the treatment, literally on the river so he can take 24-7 samples. We care about this very much. We want to get it right. We hope that you ask us questions. Um, and this isn't your only shot. For anyone who couldn't be with us here in person, please reach out to us. There's our emails. Um, I think a lot of folks in this room probably have my cell phone. Everyone's welcome to it. Please get a hold of us. Get a hold of Lloyd. Find Jeremy. Tell them, you know, thank you for living down here at this point. But um, we very much want to get it right. This is important to us. Um, Sydney, or if, we got if I questions? Could, well, I think if I could real quick, I think one question that hasn't come up yet, and I'm sure it's out there somewhere, and so we'll just kind of address, um, and I don't mean to pick a scab director, but I think it's, it's out there, and I think it goes to the point that you just said. I know that this has been an inconvenience for a lot of folks, um, but we're trying to move as quick as we can, and we're doing it to try to take care of this problem now so it's not something we have to deal with in the long term. Um, you know, I know there's, there's parks that aren't open, there's a river that you can't access, there's all of that, and I'm sure there's some folks out there that wonder why it has to be that way. I get a little bit nervous every time we're out on the river. We're working, we're doing our thing, um, but I'm sure somebody looks down and wonders, what the heck? Um, we are moving as expediently as we can. We want to address this issue. We know that it's an inconvenience, and we're doing it uh, we want that to be as temporary as we can. There's a lot of jurisdictions that have weighed in on this, um, that have an interest, and I see some faces in this room that represent some of those those entities that have, we all do have an interest, but I, I'm looking at some of those that have a lot of investment in infrastructure that impacts each of our lives every day. Um, so we'll get through this. We've got a couple weeks of treatment to get through. 
we've got some equipment we'll have to move, we'll have to make some decisions about how exactly that interaction looks afterwards, but I hope you understand that within this period of time when things are that way, um, it's because we're trying to take care of this issue now. It's for this, you know, we, when we talk about in our press releases about safety of, of the public and of us and the river, we're not just making that stuff up. We got a lot of stuff down there. We're gonna have a lot of things moving around in the next couple of weeks. Um, we really need the public to be patient because we're doing a lot of real technical stuff and we need to have our focus on that. And like I said, I didn't mean to rip a scab director, but I thought, you know, we kind of had a nice warm and fuzzy segue there and I just, it made me uncomfortable. But we, but we do need to talk about it and, and you guys are, are looking a bunch at a bunch of ag folks. It is our, not our normal first response to go in and close something. Our normal first response is to go have a conversation with a farmer or rancher about what's happening and to get through that uh, process. But we also know that, that Idaho code is very specific about what we do when we have a detection like this. There is no, there's no sitting around thinking about what we're gonna do. It is get to work and get moving as quickly as possible. And we want to continue to have a discussion with everyone in this room. Uh, we know it's gonna be a discussion probably this fall as, as some legislative committees meet as we get closer to the session, what the expectations down here. We never want to close anything longer than it needs to. It, it truly, I, I have struggled with this so mightily, and I know the commissioners have heard this from me many times. It is not the normal way that we do things in ag, um, but it's the way that we have to respond to this particular situation. So the closure is going to be as small as we can possibly make it. We also know that people will not have the appetite to keep this closed longer than it absolutely has to be. And uh, we just told you, and we, we talked about you know keeping folks off the river for safety, but we're also, uh, mindful that we're not applying it at such a rate that it's gonna cause certain problems. And so we are gonna try to work as fast as we possibly can to tell you all if we think we were successful. And that's gonna take some time, but to continue to have a conversation with everyone here locally and with state partners and with legislators and everyone to understand what we need to do to the river, with the river to balance, you know, if there's a risk of moving something or continuing to impact outside this 1% of the Snake River, and uh, also getting folks back to their normal lives and, and enjoying the river. And um, there's probably the, one of the few silver linings we have is fewer people typically are out probably as we get into the colder months, but that doesn't mean not everyone. And, and there's hunters and fishermen and folks who wanna be out in the water. And uh, we also know how important this incredibly beautiful area is to this community. It is, it is something else to be down on the water truly. And we know that everyone else wants to get back to normal. Okay, other, other questions? Have we gotten anything, any other direction? Or is, does, anyone, um, does anyone want to ask a question? I mean, we don't, yes, sir. So we, we know that the surgeon question was probably gonna come up and it's something that uh, you heard us talk about quite a bit. And so that plan meant, is there a possibility of relocating surgeon? What happens with the treatment? I mean, we have tried to come at this from a lot of different angles. One of the things, while this is, um, and a fishing game, you're gonna have to correct, correct me or you know, throw something at me here pretty soon. But um, one of the things that was interesting, I think to us who aren't as familiar with this area, and even some folks who are from this area, is how many uh, sturgeon have been stocked in that area, that it's not just all a natural, naturally occurring population. But that fish assessment from Fish and Game is gonna be really important to us understanding what this treatment does, again, in this kind of small part of the river, but fish mortality will happen. I don't know if you, if, if you all want to add anything specifically, but we know that we are going to be dealing with sturgeon mortality Unfortunately, the reality is once we find quagga mussels in an area, we're gonna be dealing with sturgeon mortality, whether we perform a treatment or we don't. That's the hard part. It's just whether or not that mortality is for a greater cause to try to limit the scope of this issue or whether it's gonna happen slowly as, as a species chokes out an ecosystem. So that is a really unfortunate biological reality that we're facing right now. We uh, have a plan in place though as, as mortality occurs to deal with some of that on the river. Um, and it's gonna be limited, but we, for a number of reasons, 
don't expect the relocation of surgeon to be re realistic based on moving muscles into other systems. And that is a hard thing for us all to, to wrap our heads around and that the assessment that is being done um, will also help future efforts on restocking. Anything else? Action game team? Yes, sir. Oh, oh. Okay, yeah, thank you, uh, Director and, and Representative. Uh, Jim Fredericks, Director at Idaho Fishing Game. So I think, I think Director Twalt nailed it. I, this is, for the most part, a hatchery supplemented population of sturgeon, which means that we can rebuild it. As you know, sturgeon don't turn into six footers overnight, so it will take some time. But uh, in the grand scheme of things, that's the trade off that we think is, is, is really the only choice. And I'm happy to visit with you as this uh, regional fish manager, Mike Peterson, here afterwards. And um, I, I did just take that one step more. Um, we really appreciate all the work that is being done by these agencies. We've taken a lot of bandwidth from everybody else to implement this, and, and the fishing game question was one really important to us, and we're trying to be very transparent about knowing that fish mortality will occur. Um, and there was a question right here. Yes, sir. Yep, and actually, Jeremy had some maps up that were on both sides. So uh, if you look at the Shoshone map, right, you've got treatment on both sides of the river. Hang tight. Let's, let's queue up some of the maps. If I can, real quick, um, we are looking at both sides because the main thing we were looking at is where is easiest point of, of mix and access. Um, and so as you, on these, these green crosses represented on, on the Shoshone Falls side, we are accessing from from the uh, the Jerome side to the to the hydro facility on that side um, of the river, and then for are you asking about the, the Twin Falls um, dam site? We're looking at that side as well. The Centennial. Um, so when we were looking at, at that, we we know that we have access uh, a little bit further downstream, but however, um, to get up to that area, it was just it made it a lot easier to get into the Centennial area. Um, they have an established boat ramp. They have an established uh, enough parking space, frankly, for us to park the equipment that we need to be able to get in, have a really good staging site to be able to move all the equipment up and down this, the river that we need to over the duration of the treatment. Okay. Other questions? And I think, yes, sir. <laughs> Yeah, that's a great question. I think we had another question come in about closures as well. So you're going to see, if you if you go onto the ISDA website, so that's agri.idaho.gov, you see a closure map. And ISDA's uh, jurisdiction extends Twin Falls Dam to Niagara Springs on the water. There are a number of other jurisdictions, some private, some public, some state, some federal, that have decided within their own within their own authority to take action as well. And, and we appreciate that is, is intended to help us to respond quickly and, and to limit, um, you know, having folks unduly interact with treatment and things like that. I don't expect those to continue indefinitely. And we also know, and this is really important, that whenever something closes temporarily, it pushes everyone else out to the next thing. That it pushes everyone, if, if Shoshone is closed, the park, it pushes everyone to jerkies and, and so on. And so I don't expect those. I, I think what you will see is um, a winnowing of those. And I, I don't mean to speak for other authorities. I obviously don't make decisions for BLM or other parks. Um, but I think as we get through the treatment and um, uh, everyone understands what the impacted area is, I think that's going to change and continue to kind of alter. The other part of it that is important is some of those park closures happened as we were out doing surveys. So what ISDA was trying to determine is how far downriver was the problem. And so we appreciate the assistance from other agencies to help give us that time to get some answers. But the map that we showed you earlier shows you the extent as we understand it today. So we do not have velodors downriver from Centennial Falls, um, at least it, what we have found. The, 
treatment will go down river a little bit in case there are some but those those park closures and other property closures were meant to help us get through sampling and to be very cautious, frankly. And I don't know if any of the irrigation partners in the room want to talk about the, the resources that you all manage, but I think everyone was trying to get their bearings and understand the extent. And so as we as we know that data, and it's really truly just been coming in uh, end of last week and this week, I think folks will make some, some decisions going forward. Okay. Other questions? Questions? Okay. Um, again, we're going to share this slideshow online. Um, please get a hold of us if you have questions. I think um, we're going to be moving helicopters tomorrow. We've got a treatment going on Tuesday. We will be doing a number of door knocking. Uh, we'll go through door knocking tomorrow to get to some additional folks on the river. Jeremy talked to you about the, the legal requirement we have for notification. We truly want to go above and beyond. Um, to get to as many people as we possibly can so everyone knows what's happening. So thank you so much for joining us tonight, and please come find us if you have questions.